Okay, we are whole here, presumably, because we are deeply interested in what makes us human, what's unique about us, what surprisingly is not unique about us. I study brain cells and primates for a living, so I come at this from a certain perspective, which is you could learn a lot by studying animals, by studying their nervous systems, their hormones, their behaviors, in order to get insight into us. Now, if you want to understand humans, though, from the perspective of we're just another animal, we're just another primate, it comes with some challenges. And some of the time, the challenge is recognizing we're just like every other animal out there. Some of the time, it's seeing that we're just like every other animal in the basic wiring, but we do utterly unique things with it. And some of the time, we do things that simply do not have precedent. Okay, let me give you an example of each. First one. Cases where we are just like every other animal and where that's often the hard thing to accept. Okay, you are a hamster. You're a female hamster. And what you normally do is about every four days or so you ovulate. Except if the scientists take another female hamster and put her in the cage with you, in which case both of you are going to lengthen your cycles and eventually synchronize so that you're both ovulating the same afternoon. So that's what you're doing now until they take a male hamster and put him into the middle of your cage, and then the two females completely unscramble their cycles and desynchronize, and it works this way. It's done with pheromones, it's done with olfactory cues. People have shown how elegant this could be. Now, instead of taking the male hamster and put him in the cage with the two females, pump the air from his cage into theirs, and they will desynchronize their cycles. It's all olfactory. Most amazing is it's not random which female synchronizes the other more. It tends to be the socially dominant one. Now, this is completely understood. It's shown in dogs and cats and pigs, and I'm told you can go to like a 7-Eleven in Iowa and buy a can of pig ovulation synchronizing spray if you want. I, I don't know, growing up in New York, we never synchronized our pigs ovulating, so I don't know why they do that in <laughs> Iowa. But you, this is sufficiently well understood that these are like commercial products. And what's most amazing about it is it works exactly the same in us, where it's known as the Wellesley effect. First described 1970, women during freshman year of Wellesley College tending to synchronize their cycles over the years, except for women who had close intimate relations with men who desynchronized. Most interesting of all, suggestions it's not random who synchronizes who. The more socially extroverted, dominant women do more. This is so well understood that like when I was in college, people would sit around the dorm and say, you know, when we roomed together the summer, I had her synchronized by August 1st. And, you know, that's, that's what you get from biologists. So some of the time what's hard to accept is we're just like every other. Some of the time what's challenging is the novel use we use for the plain old mammalian wiring. Let me give you an example here. You've got two humans. They're engaged in a ritual, they're not making eye contact, they're not speaking, they're not moving much. All they're doing is every now and then, one of them does nothing more metabolically taxing than move a small piece of wood on a table. And if these are two chess grandmasters in the middle of a tournament, they are maintaining the blood pressure of triathletes for hours on end simply with thought. And that's a whole other domain. We take the basic mammalian wiring for arousal for various emotions, and we turn it on in the most abstracted states possible. Now, finally, a challenge is under some circumstances where there's simply no precedent out there in the animal world. And let me give you sort of a, a shocking example of this. Okay, you have a couple. They come home from work at the end of the day. They talk, they eat dinner, they talk, they go to bed, they have sex, they talk some more, they go to sleep. The next day, they do the same exact thing. They come home, they talk, they eat, they talk, they go to bed, they have sex, they talk, they, they do the same thing every day for 30 days. Hippos would be repulsed by this because hardly any other species has non-reproductive sex like this and nobody talks about it afterward. And in that regard, we simply have no precedent out there. So as we begin to look at where humans fit in this spectrum, that is often going to be a challenge. My current one is finding the next button. Okay, so what I will look at here briefly, setting us up for the coming session, um, is looking at some of these domains that used to be uniquely human, which no longer are, but still where we do them in some very unique ways. 
aggression. Every time life special used to tell us at the end we're the only species that kills, that's a, we're not the only species that kills. This is something that's now observed in a number of other species. Chimps will make weapons. They will have organized violence, premeditated violence. Insofar as planning goes into it, we are not the only species. This was a baboon of mine, a male who had just joined one of my troops. And the only way to describe this guy is he had horrible political skills. He spent two weeks hassling guys he should not have gone near. And one morning, coalition of six of them formed. And this is what was left in the morning. And my 30 years of studying baboons, the leading cause of death of male baboons are male baboons. These are chimps. These are the males of a small group, and they are about to start what would be now called a border patrol. They will go to the edge of their territory, and if they encounter another chimp, a male from the next valley over, they will kill him. They will kill him, and it's documented now by Goodall and a number of other researchers. This will take into the point where the males of one group will systematically eradicate all the males of another. This is genocide. This is killing someone not for who they are, but because of what group they belong to. We are most certainly not the only species that does this. But what remains human, humanly unique about our violence is, yes, we are perfectly capable of cudgeling somebody to death with a club, but we can pull a, a trigger, we can drop a bomb from 30, we can operate a drone from the other side of the planet, we can look the other way, we could damn with faint praise, we could be passively aggressive. In those realms, we are without precedent. Remarkable story, in V.S. Naipaul's book, Travels Through Islam, he was describing something that happened in Indonesia. In the 1960s, there was some attempted coup in the aftermath, there was complete meltdown of society there. Every bit of revenge and ethnic strife was played out. A couple of million people were killed. People would go to the village over and hammer people into their huts and burn down the villages. And Naipaul had heard a rumor about this which was sometimes when the people from one village would come to the next to kill everyone, they would bring a gamelan orchestra along with them. And he found someone who had been a veteran of one of these massacres and said, I heard, is this true? And he said, yeah, we used to bring a gamelan. He said, why would you do this? And the answer was to make it more beautiful. We are unprecedented in some of the ways that we damage each other and the psychological baggage we bring with it. Okay, next domain, theory of mind, very trendy in psychology. When do kids, when they're growing up, first grasp that other individuals have different thoughts than they do, precursor for different emotions, empathy, all of that. Kids get it somewhere between ages three to five. My kids got it on the morning of their third birthdays. And this is a uniquely human thing, except it is now clear that other species have the rudiments of it. Leaping over chimps, for example, will do theory of mind. If you were a low-ranking chimp and some interesting food has been put out there and a high-ranking chimp sees it, you don't bother trying to get it. But if the high-ranking guy hasn't seen it, you, do, you know what information he has. We're not the only species that can do theory of mind. What we appear to be the only ones who can do is secondary theory of mind, to understand what that individual knows about that individual's knowledge. And that is very ornate and very human, and it's for that reason we're the only species who could possibly sit through a performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream and keep track of who knows who's doing what to who there. Again, completely unique. Next domain, the golden rule, tit for tat, do unto others, a massive amount of work in behavioral economics, neuroeconomics, done understanding the evolution of patterns of cooperation, and classic work showing that in these sort of proto games, prisoner dilemma games, tit for tat strategies are most optimal. I'll cooperate until you stab me in the back and I'll stab you back reciprocally the next time around, and these are optimized. And the second these studies were done in the 70s, all the zoologists said, aha, let's go look at our species. Do they do reciprocity with these optimized game strategies? And it turns out that's absolutely the case. And what you see, for example, is an, a case of that in vampire bats. Ooh, horrifying vampire bats. These are mommy bats taking blood from cows, keeping them in their throat sacs, and disgorging them to feed their cute babies. And what you see with vampire bats is the females do communal feeding, they have a communal nest, and they disgorge blood and feed each other's kids. 
Now, make the bats believe one of the females is cheating on their reciprocal social contract there. Net the bat as she comes out of the nest, grab her and pump up her throat sac with air and put her back in the nest. And everybody's sitting there saying, oh my God, look at all the throat sac blood she has and she's not feeding my kids. And the next time around, none of the females feed her kids. We're not the only species that works at rules for reciprocity of do unto others. What we're the only species is that one that can deal with the fact that others have different desires than you do. We don't all want to be done unto others as they would. No other species can look at this and possibly make sense of what's going on here. <laughs> Yet, we have different motivations, different priorities, different values, and what we are unique at is finding a common currency for this. Next domain, empathy, the thing that defines us, it is so we are no longer the only species with at least the rudiments of empathy. Wonderful work by Franz Duval and others showing, for example, you have a low-ranking chimp sitting there minding his own business who is spontaneously attacked by a higher-ranking guy in a bad mood. Alternative, low-ranking chimp who picks a fight with a high-ranking guy and is pummeled afterward. This guy was an innocent bystander. This guy was asking for it. And what he has shown is in the aftermath, the other members of the group are far more likely to groom the guy who was the innocent bystander than the one who provoked it. They understand intention. They understand, and they are capable of expressing more pro-sociality for victims than for perpetrators. This is not unique to humans. What is unique, though, is the... <coughs> sheer level of abstraction that we bring to our empathy. Let me give you an example of this. Okay, so look closely at this picture. This dog whose paw was caught in some sort of trap, necrotic, the paw comes, and we are recoiling looking at this. Think about what you are doing right now. You are feeling the pain of a member of another species. That is unheard of for the most part. We feel the pain for a character in a novel. We feel the pain for the people killed in the eruption in Pompeii thousands of years ago. We could look at this and we say, oh no, the poor Navi home tree is falling over an avatar. These are pixels. These aren't really real creatures. They're computer jet and we feel terrible for them. We could take empathy in realms of abstraction like no other species out there. What else used to be about us? Uniquely so, gratification, postponement, that sort of thing, working hard to delay reinforcement. And we all know that you work hard in high school to get into a good college, to get into a good grad school, to get a good job, to get into a good nursing home, and we all work on these <laughs> hugely <laughs> delayed pathways of reinforcement. But it turns out the neurobiology of it is very similar in other species. Much of it has to do with this neurotransmitter dopamine. And dopamine, cocaine works on dopamine systems, it's about reward. That's what people used to think. Take, for example, a monkey and give him an unexpected reward and these pathways of dopamine activate. Ah, dopamine is about reward. It's much more interesting than that. Now instead, train the monkey that when a signal comes on, a little light comes on, and what happens then is if the monkey presses a lever a bunch of times, it then gets a reward. It's learned this. So now when this is occurring, when does the dopamine rise? When the monkey gets the reward? No, when the signal comes on. This is the monkey sitting there saying, I know how this works. I got this down cold. Okay, it's one of those press the levers. I'm all on top of this. Dopamine is not about reward. Dopamine is about the anticipation of reward. Remarkably interesting subtle study done by Wolfram Schultz and colleagues. In this scenario, the monkey presses the lever and it gets a reward 100% of the time. Now, instead, it gets the reward unpredictably an average of only 50% of the time. What happens then to dopamine when the signal comes on? It goes through the roof. What have you just added into the equation? The word maybe. And nothing drives us to do stuff, to work in a goal-directed way than a maybe thrown in there. And it's that cusp, that fulcrum that gets generating. The psychologists who run Las Vegas have understood this forever. And what we see here is the exact same principle in the neurochemistry of another species. 
So what's unique about us in that regard? Just the incredible extent with which we are willing to delay the lag time between the signal and the lever pressing and when the reward comes and we have entire ideologies and theologies built around the reward will come in the afterlife, the reward will come unto the generations after you, this is unique. Next domain, culture. Yes, culture defining feature of humans. And in more recent years, that has become a common term in primatology. It used to be if you talked about culture with your primates, you immediately were denied tenure. Now instead, <laughs> what's clear is there are all forms of culture, probably the best studied, first seen by Jane Goodall, tool construction and use by chimps. By now, 29 different types of tool use has been observed in different chimp populations across Africa where the same tools are used in different ways in different places, different tools have evolved to solve the same job and it's passed on to the next generation. One interesting finding with this was the observation, here we have a young chimp watching her mother with a termite stick learning how to, the daughters learn much better than the sons do because the sons are off screwing around playing the whole time, the daughters are actually watching mom. So what is different in terms of human culture, just the sheer Byzantine complexity and splendor of what we can do? No other species could do this. Brine shrimp would be green with envy at the cultural complexity and rituals we could invent. We are unprecedented in that regard. Okay. Nonetheless, there are all sorts of domains where what we do is completely unique. The things we do with language, with symbols, with metaphor, the abstractions that we will come up with, the social constructs, one very, very important one initially looks just like every other species out there. As soon as you see baboons fighting with each other based on kinship lines, as soon as you see male chimps killing the males systematically in another population, you see we are not the only species that divides the world into us and them. But what we do with it are some very unique things. We're the only species that is willing to divide our us's into them and them's based on ideology based on the idea of whether workers should own their factories or not, based on ideas of whether you speak the same language, whether you wear different clothes, what your God's name is, how many of them they are, if you smell different and eat funny food and wear strange clothing, what we do with us as and thems presents one of the most central challenges to our future as humans. And what you'll hear about in the next two talks are two extraordinary leaders in the field of thinking about this issue of how we deal with thems. Do we think of all thems as the same? Do we denigrate them all in the same ways? Absolutely not, as you will hear from Susan Fisk, with tremendous insight as to the malleability with which we humans can rapidly turn us as and thems into the other category. And what you'll hear from Josh Green is this issue of how is it that we and our brains go about making moral decisions when dealing with an us versus dealing with a them and seeing these are completely different ways that we approach these issues and currently these being huge challenges for our happy survival as a species. So with that, let us transition to the next talks, starting with Susan Fisk. <laughs>